All right, we are back with Disconnect. Um, I'm Annie Pratt. I'm the president at New. We've got Mark. We've got Will. And we're going to talk about some hot topics today. And we're live. And we're live. We are. So yeah, guys, uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you guys find anything that we say insightful, uh, we, we're trying to be thought leaders in this industry and provide you guys some real world value. So if you find it interesting, uh, you know, tell someone about the show. Um, we, you know, we don't run ads. We don't do anything like that on the show. Um, we pay for the show ourselves, but we really want to you know, get some uh, insight out there, information to people about the electrification industry and everything kind of going forward here. Um, so today's topics, we're talking all things battery tech with the team. A um, lot of things are shaking up right now uh, with the governments, you know, laying down a lot of monetary, you know, incentives uh, to different companies. Uh, the first topic we're going to talk about is uh, a little relationship going on right now between Canada and Stellantis. Stellantis being, you know, the, the OEM uh, manufacturer for Dodge Ram, all these other different kind of brands that fall under that Jeep um, is another one of them too but setting up a battery plant in Canada. Um, and they actually stopped building the facility because the Canadian government is not giving them the support that they told them that they were going to give them. Um, and this actually comes after they uh, had already offered a large amount of funding to Volkswagen to setting up a power co um, battery manufacturing facility in Ontario as well. So our co is Volkswagen's battery, battery company, battery company. Exactly. Cell manufacturing company. Exactly. Um, so it's roughly a $3.7 billion battery plant that Stellantis um, supposedly is setting up with the Canadian government, but it seems that the government's holding back a little bit. Do you think, uh, I mean, maybe we should ask the, the question like, it's coming, this came from Stellantis, right? Mm -hmm. That there's a pause. Yep. Do you think maybe there's more to that story though, in terms of like maybe Stellantis did not deliver on some milestones perhaps? But I think what's interesting, maybe in terms of the topic is there are, cause we are, I mean, talking about some of these things too. Um, and there are a number of different like milestones and things you have to hit to mm -hmm. clear like the next hurdle, right? Before, the next sort of amount of funding comes, right? Or the next piece comes. Yeah. Building a battery factory mm -hmm. is, as we know, is not it's not easy. hard or not easy. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> not, it's yeah. Hard. I think that's a good point, Mark. I mean, we've been looking into this heavily um, with the American government and every program is structured toward milestones like you're talking about. So I, I do wonder, um, is the program the same in Canada structured? And maybe is this a bit of a PR stunt, stunt yeah. to put some pressure um, or to maybe to shift some pressure away from Stellantis and onto the Canadian government? I wonder, like, because we talk about this a lot um, and we've talked about it, in our, you know, in our last board meeting, we've talked about publicly, like the mm -hmm. IRA bill, the grant funding that's out there here mm -hmm. in the U.S., um, Canada is another option. I think we've even been approached by a couple of couple individuals of groups, that yeah. sort of represent over there. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, if your focus is on building a business around the incentives, then what if the incentives go away? Yeah, what are what you going to do? Yeah. 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 We've yeah. always said, remember, we, when we started and we started pitching the XT. Um, which to clarify to everyone is still on the vision and yep. on the roadmap. Still but the roadmap. Um, when we talk about it. We always talk about, we have to be competitive and the business has to work if incentives go away, go away. completely. It's, That's right. We actually removed them from our internal financial model because right. we said we can't count on them. I almost feel like build a business regardless. Yeah. I almost feel like too many companies are like really pitching this now because they're like, Oh, the IRA has all these funds available and everyone's like coming for the, the crumbs of the pie. We've probably seen what half a dozen, at, maybe half a dozen at most mm -hmm. uh, publicly traded EV companies or battery companies mention like the IRA bill mm -hmm. or government funding even big OEMs mention it mm -hmm. as part mm -hmm. of their like funding strategy. But we know talking to sort of these yeah. different organizations, right. That that can't be your primary funding strategy. Mm -hmm. You almost have to like raise the capital without mm -hmm. that. Yeah. 
100%. Yeah, I think that's something that is not widely known is any government funding, you have to have raised the capital already. And it's sort of a match situation. And you can negotiate how much they will match, but there's no reality where government funding is your only source of capital no. or even your lead source of capital mm -hmm. in, in funding a business like this. Yeah, I mean, we'll like, because we've talked to Stellantis mm -hmm. ourselves, mm -hmm. right, about some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, what do you think this is going to do? Do you think like how this could be good or bad, right, for them to pause? Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think this is going to do from like an image execution standpoint? So I think that... Uh, it plays into not only the relationship that Stellantis has with the government, but it's going to play into the government's, not only the Canadian government, but also the U S relation governments with all the other big OEs too, because from what I'm reading on this Reuters, um, you know, piece that is all around this PR it's, you know, they're, they're stopping production on this because of the support that they've already given to VW, which includes 700 million in, in grants and another 13 billion in subsidies. And they're feeling they like over promise. It, it sounds like the government almost went and it's almost like a level of favoritism. Like they blew their budget. It's like either they blew their budget or they just, um, it's almost like, yeah. Like how, how can we generate like they're picking a team? Yeah. yeah. We, mm. You know, how like you and I have these discussions all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, about, um, everyone, we go to these events, you go to a ton of these events mm -hmm. and everyone's like, Government needs to step in. Government needs to mandate. Government needs to fund. Government needs to subsidize. It, and then in this situation, potentially, somebody picked a side. Yep. And now you have a favorite. Mm -hmm. So everyone's screaming for help. But then if you don't get the helping hand, you're going to scream that somebody else was favored. Or you're going you know, to you're gonna, mm -hmm. you're gonna stop production. You're going to screw yourself over. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this also... And to put it bluntly, this is where it's time to be an adult <laughs> and say, you know, <laughs> you're building a business, you know, don't scream at somebody else, right? And don't yep. complain when somebody else isn't solving your problems for you. Mm -hmm. If you have the capital, which let's face it, these OEMs they do. do. If, yeah, they, they do. do. Yep. Like if you have the capital, build this stuff, execute against it. Like, you know, don't whine and complain when someone else Looking is for a doing handout. it for you. Yeah. yeah. I would also love to see some of these governments take a stance and say, you know what, we're going to support some of the smaller businesses. Yes. Um, they are so afraid of risk that working with these companies like Stellantis that are monsters already um, feels safe to them. But wouldn't it be awesome if they were actually supporting and making more of an effort to support the companies? that truly need it. Like Stellantis doesn't need it. They don't need it. And, yeah. and, but isn't it also true that some of these smaller businesses are the ones that are actually driving the change in the industry? Yeah. The innovations is or so much more be, small scale right? than um, at a lot of these, even if OEs. they aren't yet. Yeah. Like it, they, I, I think startups, small companies, organizations, they're the ones that uh, you're absolutely right. They need more help than these big OEMs. Mm -hmm. Now, the government's very risk averse, maybe, especially the U.S., like mm -hmm. DOE, because they, they've yeah. had some black eyes in the yep. past. But from those black eyes, you don't, like, overcorrect, right, and go the other way. Mm -hmm. You focus on who's really driving innovation, who's building a business model that's actually viable to work. Mm -hmm. um, and these big OEMs, they have... They have the capital to yeah, do this. They, they do. You know, if they're not willing to invest it themselves, then, you know, are they really all in on this? Yeah. It's are almost, they really, you know, it, driving that change? Yeah, and it's almost mm -hmm. like if their processes weren't so long because of how many hands things have to exchange within those big OEs, I feel like that would drive innovation so much faster. Their cost is higher than oh, anybody else. Yeah, yeah. It, it's so crazy. And, um, you know, there's one thing that I argue a lot about with people on LinkedIn, especially just because that's where all the professionals go to socially network from a, a perspective in this industry is to your guys' point with the smaller companies that are driving innovation, they're not getting as many dollars just simply because their footprint isn't as big. But in reality, their innovation it's could, bigger. Yeah, it could. Well, it, it's it is also so much bigger. the the process because we're we're looking at this. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna say that uh, we're not uh, looking at it, right? We're yeah. we're looking at it significantly. Yeah. 
Um, the process to go through securing any sort of funding support from the government is a beast. Mm -hmm. And there's a due diligence piece that candidly, it's going to cost us a ton of money to just get through the process. And so I'd love to see the government say, you know what, we're actually going to remove some of the barriers to entry to come get this capital so that these innovators who are smaller and have less resources can even be considered. Mm -hmm. And really also working with the companies that are doing the necessary to bring that industry forward too. Cause like when I look at, um, you know, just say the infrastructure piece with charging networks and everything like that, that in no way, shape or form right now through, it's not even going to make a dent. It's not going to make a dent and you're not going to bring consumers over as much as you'd like to, no matter how much you're going to mandate people or mandate businesses like California, they're no offense to California, but man, they're really, pushing an envelope that they're having a real tough time licking the licking the top I mean, to close it yeah just you know to be I mean? clear like i we're we've sort of taken a stance well i wouldn't say new but mark has taken a stance that government mandated change is not the right way to go nope. because it, it forces you to adopt something that's not necessarily standard it forces organ basically it's saying all these big oems you didn't want to make change you, mm-hmm. You're not looking to the future. You're not looking at opportunities. So we're going to force you to do that. Mm-hmm. When you have mm-hmm. all these smaller organizations that are like, listen, we see the future of this. Mm-hmm. We see the opportunity. Why aren't we like maybe pushing for them to have the opportunity? Don't push those that don't want to change. Mm-hmm. Like don't continuously push them to give them the opportunity. Push the smaller organizations, right? Whether it's startups or existing organizations and companies, those are the ones that you want to drive forward. Mm-hmm. The rest of them, they have the capital, they have the means, they can catch up. Yep. But, yeah. um, you know, give that opportunity there because that's where change comes from. Change rarely comes from a big company. And let's face it, in the automotive industry, since day one, change has never come naturally from an OEM. Mm-hmm. They've always been forced, yep, forced. to make change. They yep. Every single time, whether it's from an emission standpoint to a safety standpoint, there is always a regulation or a rule or something driving them or forcing them to Mm -hmm. change. Whereas in the sort of small business startup ecosystem, especially around energy infrastructure and mobility in this space, 99% of that change is actually coming from the smaller businesses, the startups, even, I mean, you can argue Tesla is, is a large conglomerate, right? And they've sort of driven a lot of change, but it's Mm -hmm. all coming from that side. Well, and it's, and it's operating in an agile way, you know, like I was saying earlier with those big OEMs and how much organizational handing off of ideas and, and trying to drive change has to exchange so many different hands. It's almost like it's its own bureaucracy, like a, like a, like a bureaucratic nightmare internally, because if someone doesn't agree with an idea, then that idea gets shot down, even if it makes it halfway up the chain or something like that. Um, it's one of those things where smaller groups and smaller companies and um, just overall innovators in this space, they can move so much faster to provide something that's actually real world changing. Um, So I think that there's a big piece with the government needing to do what's necessary, but also go work with the smaller groups you know, from a, a perspective of like not only new as, as our own company, but ones that are really driving change and not just checking a box saying we're going to give, you know, 100 mil or $100 billion to Ford and SK to set up a, a battery manufacturing plant. Because also that plays into, uh, you know, the government and build back better talking about American made companies. Well, mm-hmm. sure, the OEM's an American made company, but. We're also going outside of none of those battery suppliers are. Yeah. Yeah. We're not, we're, we're going outside of what, you know, traditionally has never actually been done here. What we're doing at new or we're, we're trying to change that. We are currently the only U S born U S raised battery manufacturing company, but we're trying to really set a new standard for what it, like really American made is. And it's, and it's, mm-hmm. it's basically going with the government and saying, Hey, come, come look at what we're doing. Cause we're trying to really provide real world value and innovation. Whereas they're going to go just because they have a big OEM backing 
to partner with a foreign entity to give them hundreds of billions of dollars. And we're like, Hey, well, what about us? Like we're American made. Let's build back better how it was supposed to be. I think it's just the, I mean, you and I both agree yeah. on that. Yeah. Right? Like we don't, <laughs> there's not much to get in there, but mm-hmm. um, to Annie's point earlier today, it's the risk side of mm-hmm. it and the risk tolerance that we're seeing a hesitation in. Mm-hmm. Um, and the focus of this, the spirit behind this is to unblock this change, right? It's to, it's not necessarily to, to, to force it. I think the spirit behind sort of these funding opportunities is to, how do we unblock this? How do we accelerate this? How do we push this change forward? And lowering the, the barriers to adoption, while it's risky, you still have to do your due diligence, mm-hmm. Those barriers, there are certain pieces of that that don't have to be as costly, I guess, um, in order to facilitate this change. You could still, due diligence is not whether or not you can write a $100 million check today, although that is part of it, right? They don't fund 100%. I think yeah. uh, a lot of people right. think they fund 100%. They don't. No. It's like 40% to, what is it, 60%, Annie? Yeah, I think they they rarely go above 50. And then based on, at least what we've heard, based on the due diligence process, um, they'll come in anywhere from like 20 to 50%. Yeah, so you as an organization, you're like, you're de-risking this because you have to plan for, in our opinion or my opinion, you should plan for 100% funded by yourself mm-hmm. first. Mm-hmm. And then leverage this as, you know, a way to sort of save capital, right? To be able to, like, facilitate kind of, um, you know, how do we how do we raise the capital we need, start to execute on this plan, and then use the government funding opportunities to support, support it and mm-hmm. de-risk it from our perspective. Whereas I think if you're an organization and a company and you're saying, listen, I'm going to raise... 60% of the funds and the other 40% is like guaranteed to come from them. Good luck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, what's kind of scary. So um, if you listen to some of these other startup companies, the way they talk about specifically like the DOE loan program, right? it's, they're talking about it. Like um, it's going to be their primary source of capital and like, it's a slam dunk and we're learning about this um, and we've got a new addition on our team to run this program. She's done this before for another battery company. Uh, All we know says that that's not how that works. So um, it's a little scary to hear some of these other companies and the way they're talking about it. And if they fail, that failure is not just going to, it's going to affect all of us. It's going to affect everyone. And then it's also going to look kind of bad on the government too, in a, in a way, yeah. because like they might've been engaged with them no matter how many dollars they actually give them. Um, you know, it, it also comes down to, okay, we've got this amount of money that is available in funding and everyone thinks they're going to come by and get like this massive chunk of the pie. Well, I think that's important too, is um, there doesn't seem to be a shortage of funds coming through the loan program office. No, every time we DOE talk to them, right, they're like, we, we have so much money left. Like, yeah. So we're not rooting against anyone. Like, I want to see all these startup mm-hmm. companies get get packages with the DOE. Um, but I think we should all be, like, really real about how it works. Mm-hmm. And to your point, Mark, like, these companies need to have a viable way to fund the business regardless of this. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. You have to do it. Don't plan on this to be your thing, right? That's going to take you there. hundred mm-hmm. percent. And maybe, maybe, maybe I'll get proven wrong and <laughs> it'll be a slam dunk and this will be our primary source of funding and what you guys can all say, New, new, I told you so. And we'll be happy about that. But <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, think that's that, how it's going to work. We would not be opposed to that feedback. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, um, doesn't seem likely. Yeah, exactly. So if we're going to transition now to another topic that we have, um, outside of obviously the infrastructure need, um, you know, for charging networks and, and everything that kind of accompanies that with battery energy storage systems, there's a huge emphasis that's been, I want to say over the last quarter where aviation is really becoming a hot topic and what 
most, I'm, I mean, I'm from an aviation family. Um, I mean, and this all comes with a, a massive announcement from CATL, you know, on, around their 500 watt hour per kilogram. Uh, Ampris and yeah, there's Amprius a bunch of companies, and, right, that are announcing these like super high energy dense. Yeah. And then one battery company announced they're shifting away from EVs and going to consumer markets. That was, that was going to be our third topic we were going to mm-hmm. talk about quantum right. escape. So we can just, t- let's just tie it in together because I yeah, feel yeah, like they, they kind of go together in, in everything. So. Um, yeah, CATL in April came out with a 500 watt hour per kilogram pouch battery. I think it was what it was. Which uh, for, for the like normal people here, uh, what does that mean? So it's basically, it's talking about the amount of energy stored per unit mass, right? So kilograms a unit yep. mass. So, um, if you want to think about it in terms of like how much energy can you store in like a pound, right? Pound would be mass yep. times gravity pulling it down, but, um, in this case, 500, I think the average in the industry is around, the 4680 is 244, 244. our cell is 254, mm-hmm. um, and... Twice as much punch per volume. Basically, you're talking about, yeah, like twice as much, um, well, stored energy stored per energy. volume. Not necessarily punch, okay. but like stored energy. Yeah, Because um, there's two ways to think about it. There's like a power cell, which is like, it's like a little tiny guy that can punch really hard. Right. Mm-hmm. And then there's for, like a, for just a short period of time for a short period of time. Yeah. And then there's like an energy cell, which is, mm-hmm. I don't punch very hard, but like I can punch you a lot. Marathoner. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a marathoner. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of one way like to think about it. And these guys have all, these companies have all announced, um, 500 yeah. watt hour. I think there's another Between one out four there to that's 500, like yeah. talked about something even higher, like a thousand watt hours per kilogram. Like SES or something. or something like that did that? Yeah. can't remember who it so was. So in the aviation industry, weight, especially for these VTOL companies, but even like standard flight, you know, yeah. style aircraft, mm-hmm. weight is this like critical thing. You're not flying if you're too heavy and you're not landing if you're too heavy. Yeah. And in the amount of energy per unit, both volume and weight matters because that's going to determine how far they can go. Mm -hmm. What's their factor of safety tied Mm -hmm. to that, right? Like all those things matter. Yep. But then the one thing that no one wants to talk about today, and I'm just going to ask for it and call it out is how many times can you do that? Mm. So what we've seen in the industry is at least to date, and, and maybe these guys have solved the problem. Mm-hmm. And if they have, we want to learn more. Mm-hmm. Um, but when the energy density goes up, the number of times you can actually cycle that cell and still have that energy goes down. Mm-hmm. And in the aviation industry, especially in the electric VTOL industry, because we've been yeah, in Evitol, conversations yeah. with a number of these companies, they are targeting like what they call a fuel cost mm-hmm. to be competitive with like what jet fuel today yeah, what today with aviation is right yeah. and their fuel cost is calculated by the electricity and energy consumed mm-hmm. but also how many times the battery cycles um and the cost of that battery that's in that vehicle is then tied into their fuel cost estimates which drives the ride price um, up price up right mm-hmm. so like mm-hmm if we think about their target is here, one, what's the cost of this battery right now? Mm-hmm. Is it going to hit their targets, right, from a cost standpoint? Because basically what they're saying is, let's say it goes 500 times, right? So mm-hmm. that's 250 trips, Yep. right, there and back, mm-hmm. round trips. So 250 times they have to pay for the electric, like electricity energy, and then they also have to replace the battery. Yep. Right. And if they're doing that, what is that overall cost? And if... Yeah, you could go further, mm-hmm. but then what if you, like, there's a there's a math number there, right, that's like, how much further can you go, yep. and then how much, how many times can you do that before you have to replace that vehicle, and that basically determines your cost of operations. And not to mention, like, the concept behind, if you're going to go out and try to do, like, uh, you know, this whole promotion between airports and city centers, and you're trying to service these... Uh, uh, we lost Danny. Uh-oh. Anyways... Uh, you're, you're trying to service these, um, you know, let's just call it ultra wealthy executives that are trying to, you know, ditch the traffic and get, you know, to the airport as fast as possible. Well, what if, you know, there's someone who's already waiting on the vehicle to get there, but the battery technology is, is not to a point yet, let alone the infrastructure to support this kind of charging, but it's not to a point where they can 
charge that vehicle back up in, you know, 15 minutes and be ready to rock. Um, Cycle time. Andy, did, did we lose you for a minute? We're good. We're good okay, we're back. Okay. We're good. Right. Um, so yeah. yeah, like there's like this whole infrastructure piece, but then there's also to your point, cycle on si- the cycle time and the charging ability to be able to service more customers more often. But if you do that, then your cycles go you're, down. You're, yeah. 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 Your vehicle, you know, you're going to have to replace like, the battery. Is, go ahead. What's the cycle requirement? Like, um, we know vehicles really well, mm-hmm. but for aviation, what we, is that quantity relative to like a consumer? We talk truck? like two thousand, I think cycles. Yep. Like it'd be like a thousand okay. flights per replacement. I think is somewhere around what the they conversations were of what they mm-hmm. were asking for. Okay, um, interesting. But they have like a dollar per watt hour cost, right? right? Mm-hmm. Which is like dollar Do per know what energy that is? storage unit. A um, specific energy density too. They they yeah. require like a, a minimum uh, two hundred and sixty watt hours per kilogram. Right. So because of the space available. Yeah, yeah. because of the space available. And then also when you take off and land, you have to have a specific amount of energy where um, majority of your energy is actually used, especially in the EVITOL space, is used in takeoff to be able to get the the thing yeah. off the ground. Because if you think about how like Ospreys work. Yeah, um, you know they have to go up, and as they go up, they still have to rotate their rotors forward. So they're yeah, actually they start they're actually losing altitude as they rotate forward. So it's kind of like a, a dip in the a dip in the road for them. Yeah. So, so they it, mm-hmm. in all of these instances, um, and you know this because your family's mm-hmm. like in here. Mm-hmm. The amount of time that an aircraft sits still is just money wasted. Yep. So you might go, let's call it 40 miles, which I think is the maximum I've seen. There's probably somebody out there to go further, but mm-hmm. it's typically around 40 miles, I think is what everyone's targeting, which 40 miles, if there's no traffic, is less than an hour in a car. Yep. You might get there in like 15 minutes, right? But it's less than an hour in a car. Mm-hmm. Um, in an aircraft, it's sort of like you got to go up, you go, you come back down, right? It's probably 30 minutes, to do that. So unless there's traffic, I, I don't buy that you're saving anything from that standpoint, but mm-hmm. in order for this coming to- from the guy who like loves to drive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like I would be all over that. I'm like, you save me 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Let's well, especially if you, yeah, you probably would be like, yeah, I can sit back and like save me 20 minutes and then it just drops me off. Take a nap. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. This from the woman who doesn't go to grocery stores. Right. And like, yes. yeah, yeah. Every second. yeah, everything could be automated. Yes. Um, I just going to fire back a little bit. I love to drive. Okay. I would, I would fly if I could like fly this thing. Right. Like we're all going to be flying around in the future and Mark's still going to be driving. I'm going to be driving down the road. There is something to say about the open road though. I will there say, is. well, you could fly from your house to the office. Oh man, yeah. that would be nice. But yeah, to make that viable, they have to turn around that aircraft and like make the next trip. And if, mm-hmm. if it's treated like an Uber, what if there's no one there? So Going they have to back. basically create like uh, m- like little mini airports. It's a good destination. Of, right? Yeah. They're called like, um, I think one company is doing this. It's like the Volocopter guys. And yeah. they're, they're the only ones that are really, to my knowledge or what I've seen, there's probably some smaller other groups out there, but uh, they're V-Ports subsidiary that's like mm-hmm. really focused on like these kind of like little hubs where like, the Evitol will land there and, and be there. Um, but like, you can also like come and like have a drink or something like that. They're basically turning it into like a executive center where you can like hang yeah, out. Yeah. It's sort of like everybody comes mm. and then they sort of shoot around to these little notes, yeah. right. And mm-hmm. drop people on and off. But all of that plays into like the cost model of yep. what you're doing. So we see these announcements and they're very exciting mm-hmm. and they're saying, Hey, it's almost commercially available, but what is the cycle count? Because that matters in the industry from mm-hmm. a cost perspective. Now, it, it, the first ones, maybe it doesn't, right? The yep. first ones is like early adopters, like just get it out there, prove that it works, right? And we'll mm-hmm. improve on that and reduce costs. They'll get on the road. to cost at scale. Yeah. Look but at, in this application, what is scale? I don't even know. I don't know if you can get it's to cost at huge. scale. You have to, it's got to be enormous. And then if you're, let's say these guys are doing, call it five flights a day. Um, so, and it's, it's going to be expensive. Flights, it's 200 like days a year. Yeah, it's going to be trips, expensive. And then they're going to replace a pack. Um, so if you look at all of these guys, if it does like a thousand cycles, but if it's doing 500 cycles, it's a hundred trips a year. Then re- they're replacing a pack that the production costs, scaling yeah, cost, like 
all of that stuff, it has to move with it to the point where it's going to get to a scale of like the passenger EV market, mm -hmm. right? On the for road going like the passenger affect car everything. market from a scale perspective, just to cycle yeah. that hardware product. Mm -hmm. um, so these announcements are cool and they are very, very important, right? Mm -hmm. Double the energy density in a vehicle. We lost Danny again. In a vehicle um, really like matters, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can go further, right? You can tow more, you can do a bunch of stuff. All that stuff like, mm -hmm. does matter. So, Annie, we'll get you, like, halfway through the conversations. <laughs> um, and then it's just I only people. need to hear, like, 60% of the words. Yeah, you've fun. heard all of this before. <laughs> so, yeah, um, improvements um, like this are, are, are big, but it also comes down to, yeah, the cost and then overall what is that going to do from your for your vehicle application and your end user. Because, once again, mm -hmm. in this entire electrification space, this is going to come down to customer experience. Yeah. And, and what they already know. I mean, me being from an aviation family, I know that, any big commercial plane will probably never go electric. It'll probably be a hybrid of some sort. Never? I, I, think, it, I, I think it will. I, I don't know, will. guys. No, no, I would, okay. Smaller not, planes. Smaller planes, not big planes. There's too many people. Wait, there's like a, there's like a weight threshold. You don't think Southwest will be electric? Oh, I think Southwest will go electric. They'll Absolutely. be the first. They'll, They'll probably, probably be like the first one, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think they will. I, I don't know... With like cylindrical cells and prismatic cells today, no, no, you're not going to get there. The innovation is in the future, mm -hmm. um, and it's and I'm just going to say it because I've already got like Lawrence is writing up the patent right, and it's like <laughs> going, um, but it's going to be structurally integrated right. into, into the vehicle like itself. The, yeah, into the actual aircraft itself. Like imagine it's a like wing. Celta. A wing. That... Yeah. Well, I mean, that's where they that's where they currently um, you know, for big commercial planes. I mean, I grew up on a Cessna 172 and uh for most people who don't know, that's where the plane wing is above you. Yeah. So it's um it's very interesting that they store you store all of your fuel in the wings. Yeah. So to your point I could see them doing that. I mean, commercial aircraft stores it in the wing, right? Mm -hmm. They might have an extra. Like, they do one it or two uh, under the, the under, belly. underbelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I could see it happening. I think it'll it'll come down to innovations on the the actual weight of the batteries yeah. and all the thermal management it systems. It has to be dual purpose. Yeah, it, it, it can't be mm -hmm. like you can't be designing something to carry. And actually, we talk about this even on the vehicle side, right? Today, mm -hmm. and even what we're doing immediately right now you're carrying a weight, yep. like you're carrying an object. Yep. But in the vehicle segment, I think that'll be the first thing to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I th I'm biased. I think news is going to be the first company to actually do this. But uh, it has to be an integrated structural functional member beyond just like build a box to carry a box, right? To, mm -hmm. you know, carry a box. It's got to be integrated into it, and Annie said it perfectly. The wing, like it has to be this like integrated thing in the wing. It's got to be part of the structure. You have to like eliminate, you know, the idea of like what a wing looks like today. And then I think we will get there. Yeah, I think, I and I'm fairly confident. Twenty years, we are going to see a transatlantic that. flight that is a hundred percent electric on a large, like, 200-person, 300-person passenger aircraft in I could 20 years. I could see that. 20 years. Yeah. That that makes – I'm glad you're not being, like, California and you're saying, like, hey, 2030. 2030, we're, we're gonna get be it there. done. <laughs> we're going to be there. We're going to get this yeah. done. Um, I, I think 20 years, if we get to, say, what, it, what, what do you want to call it, 2045? Yeah. Let's just call it that. That would be, that would be really cool, and, and I think that we will see it now. Just like vehicles on the road today, that comes with the infrastructure need that's going to have to support not only the fast charging mm -hmm. of those planes. You're talking a lot of energy inside we're, there. Yeah, yeah, we're talking batteries galore. Yeah, We're going to need it everywhere. 4.5 megawatts is going to be like one wing. One, yeah. Like you're gonna plug yeah, it won't be One enough. wing, two wings, right? Plug it in. Yeah, it's, it's going like to be. It's like a gate. If you think about gate operations too, not only the gate, but also the, oh. the bag carriers and like everything else. That oh, it's everything just, else is going to be. Yeah, one, yeah. For one gate yeah. operation, that's going to be like 10 megawatts. So this goes back to why, because uh, I, I think I mentioned it earlier today. I was trying to talk more about it. How you do a lot of flying. Mm -hmm. um, how often do you see a plane sit for an hour at the gate 
rarely. And right? Let, it's like 20 minutes, 30 minute like burn. Right? Yeah. To, they get those cleaners on the plane between real quick. airlines, which is fascinating. Right. So if you listen to like the, I think Mark, you told me about this, the Southwest origin story. Yeah. It was on how I built this. Um, and the guy talks about their whole business model was built around the 10 minute turnaround. Yeah. It's genius. Just to churn that vehicle right around, right. For those business mm-hmm. passengers to fly. Mm-hmm. And that's going to come into like charge times and cycle times mm-hmm. and reliability of that them. and power delivery. All that stuff has to be solved, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, not to plug, but like that's where new comes in, right? Like we're focused on solving that problem. So if we imagine like an airport full of 737s that are all electric, what does that charging infrastructure look well, like? Well, once what I was saying earlier, like one gate, Think about each gate has its own dedicated baggage trolley, like vehicles that bring your checked bags up. Um, You know, you have the the energy that goes into moving the gate to even come up to the side door of the plane. Mm -hmm. Um, You've got various different pieces that are in there. Like even the, I mean, today the the plane still needs to charge an onboard battery for the avionics systems. So like, that's obviously going to tie into it, but I think it's going to be per gate. You're probably going to be looking at 10 megawatts. You know, what's really cool is when I think about the future of battery and I just popped into my head is the redundancy that can be had Mm -hmm. in these systems. Like today, if you lose like a fuel tank leaks, right. Or you have a problem with like an engine, you actually could potentially lose power in an aircraft, right? Mm-hmm. You lose all your engines, right? You lose power. You have the APU, right? If there's any fault there, they have some redundancy in mm-hmm. there. But the future of the space is like if a single cell dies or a single like module or section of a pack dies, you could shut it off. And like you would go from say a thousand miles to 950 miles of range and still be, you know, fine, right? Mm-hmm. The, that's the one thing that I think is very sort of exciting about this electrification future is the amount of, cause it's, it becomes like software and hardware and, and cloud-based systems. Yeah, yeah. Less moving part. Like all of these things are super exciting. Um, but charging infrastructure and planes in the future specifically, uh, I think the first iterations are going to be like fuel stops where you have like a plug in the ground and then you have like a cable and you like plug it into the aircraft Mm-hmm. Okay. And and sort of like like a retractable plug, kind of like kind of yeah. The but it, in the it um, retracts it back. Yeah, like retracts it back. But in the uh, smaller private, like privately owned aircraft space, and mm-hmm. I there's a term for that. I can't think of what it is. But um, yeah, char- charter space, charter PJ? space, and stuff. Yeah, charters. Oh. Wait, what'd you say? PJ. PJ yeah. private, Pri- private jet. Private jet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Char- What's yeah, what the, the Kardashians space. call it? Yeah, <laughs> I, PJ. Um, I picture that as like being similar to filling up your car where like you literally just pull up to like this station and you get out and you just like unplug and plug this thing into your aircraft mm-hmm. and like, that's it. Yeah. It's kind of um, like, um, yeah. in in like the, the small aircraft, I mean, just coming from my dad's, uh, you know, using my dad's Cessna and stuff like that, you either have a fuel truck that comes to you or you got to pull the plane over to the, the tank wherever it's at it like it's small we, like airports like with electricity you could like deploy this at every gate right yeah you wouldn't need fuel trucks right. anymore i nope. mean they do that in large airports with fuel today right? yeah it comes mm-hmm. out of like the ground but yeah. um you could <laughs> literally it comes out of the ground into a tank and then out of the so ground are there again giant and, tanks yeah. underground right now i guess they, i've never really thought about this. they move fuel under the tarmac right and then they like you typically have mm-hmm. like a thing that you open and they just plug in yeah right? big I hose think that pump it, yeah it plugs in the, on the under on most commercial aircraft today it plugs in on the underside of the um thing and like kind of like locks in um okay but like for smaller aircraft that's not typically the solution you either have to have the truck come to the come to the plane and then drive on the other side of the plane too because the tanks are separate so it'll have to be like that or if you're in such a small plane like a Cessna then you like if there's no available truck to pull up to you you have to dr- like basically maneuver the yeah plane maneuver the plane it. drive the plane over to the tank but but think about it this way like today go to uh what is it deer valley or scottsdale mm-hmm. airport right which is like the private mm-hmm. plane mm-hmm. kind of capital of this city State, you know yeah. the valley here mm-hmm. those two airports 
in both of those locations, everybody's plane could be like plugged in, slow charging, and all of their little storage space. Yeah, their like hangers. In the yeah. Hangar. All their little hang. Yeah, if they have mm-hmm. a hanger or whatever it is. Yeah. And they're just always, you know, more or less ready to go. Mm-hmm. Or you could map it out. You could like say, hey, I'm chartering a flight, and it just like starts putting energy into mm-hmm. it. Um, so the future of the infrastructure side of that space, I think, is going to be super exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, battery technology, like what CATL announced, is, is super interesting. And I, I mm-hmm. think that's a step forward. But it's not a – it doesn't solve the overarching, solve it, like, yeah. problem yet. Yeah. Um, it's cycle, that it's cycle piece is such a – It's still a race to, to scale with right. cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Count, well, right? not only the cycles for the for the application that's doing the flying, but the cycles that are you know probably going to be LFP or whatever chemistry that's going to have the longest cycle life for the energy storage on site. Except you can't get yeah. So their problem is you can't get the cycle count. You can't get the energy density with LFP currently. Yeah, um, you get the cycles, just not the energy density yeah. that's needed to deploy that kind you, of infrastructure. You always trade energy density for power density for cycle count, mm-hmm. right? Like you always trade one of those three things. Yep. Um, and it, it, when it's talking about chemistry, like mm-hmm. chemistry alone, you're, you have to pick those three. Yep. That exists for solid state. It exists for sodium batteries, lithium, for metal. lithium metal batteries. Like it does not matter. Mm-hmm. In every instance, you're trading one of those three things. It's sort of like the, that, at a, that old sort of like mindset of like, do you want speed, cost, or quality, which mm-hmm. I actually think is a bullshit like one, but even it's one size that, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's one yeah. that everybody references and it's like you pick mm-hmm. two, right. And you get to pick which ones you want, except in batteries, <laughs> you can't get like, you could get power density and energy density, but then like one cycle. Yeah. That's right? not going to do it, any it good. It doesn't work. So, um, so I'm curious, like what is the actual cycle count of that system? And mm-hmm. you know, where, where are the other details? Also, yeah, I, did they talk about a chemistry or anything? Uh, I uh, didn't see I don't, it. I don't think, I don't see it in the, the it just says it's, it's a condensed battery. So there's, I, I take it it's probably coming off of. It could be anything. It could be a lithium metal battery. It could be a, a silicon anode, like high energy density. I believe I it was lithium a, metal is what he I was saying. I think it's a semi-solid battery, right? It's a, you know semi-solid system or something like that so gotcha um, Mm -hmm. but you know it'll it'll be interesting to see where it goes um definitely for that industry but we still have to solve the infrastructure piece and yeah for our last topic here real quick uh we are going to jump over into what we were talking about earlier the quantum scape situation so Uh, pivoting yeah another (laughs) big big (laughs) pivot we're talking bigger than a a a, a Uh, typical travel on a basketball court in an nba game big pivots i i wonder um, Go Kings. What? <laughs> what? 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 Um, no did, longer making EV electric vehicle batteries. They've pivoted to nobody who's heard of this. They're pivoting to consumer electronics like iPhone batteries and stuff like that. Okay. If I'm putting my logic hat on, because mm-hmm. um, there's another company uh, that did the same thing. They originally, everybody says like, oh, consumer electronics, EVs, energy storage, our batteries can be used everywhere. And then they right. also, and it's another public company that de mm-hmm. Are you talking about Anovix? Anovix. Yeah, Anovix, that, yeah. Like yep. said, hey, we're just going to do like consumer level batteries. Um, yep. And QuantumScape is doing, I guess, the same thing now. Yep, they've moved that way. The only, there, there are two things here. One it's probably faster to market to do a consumer battery. Well, yeah. Because yep. there's less, Smaller. like OEMs are hard to get into. Or to even consumer work with, battery. Yeah. I mean, Annie and I come from a space where we used consumer level batteries. Mm-hmm. Um, you can like move really fast, but the volume of energy that you're going to move in that space is going to be super small. Very small. And this thing has, what, a 5 amp hour battery, battery in my phone? It. Yeah, it's You have super small. 8,000 of these in one Tesla. Yeah. Equivalent, right? So mm-hmm. the the amount of volume you're going to do is going to be super low. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's primarily done overseas in, like, um, areas, right, where it's low labor cost. It's where most like 90% of consumer products are manufactured, which means you're going to have to push your operation overseas if you're going to be competitive in that space. And also the Um, supply chain piece too, the minerals and everything that has to go into that product. Yeah, but 
if you're trying to do like a time to market thing, it's not a horrible strategy. I just would have done it up front. Yeah. Um, like I, wonder how they, about it. I wonder how like early yeah. investors feel about that because it's, it's just one of those things where you, you pitch like, you know, VW and all these other big companies, BMW, I think also invested in them as well. Um, obviously we, we know that VW started power co and they're like, we're just going to do this ourselves. Cause investing yeah. in all Your these first conversation with them was interesting. Yeah. Investing yeah. in all these, these different battery startups that have de or gone public. And now they're starting to pivot away from, you know, what these companies invested in them for. It's like, you know, how do you got, how do you really feel? You know, how, well, like, that's, that's what we I've should got ask. to imagine early investors in quantum scape to Mark's point are just getting impatient and they're like, get yeah. a freaking product to market. Mm -hmm. Um, which we all know that that's a very hard thing to do, but especially for solid state, they were so early mm -hmm. when they spacked. Um, they were I mean, being pre revenue. Level. Yeah. What's that? They were at coin cell level, which is like, exactly. Yeah. They were science experiment, um, and then become public, which we've gotten the feedback, hey, becoming public pre-revenue is early and unusual, but we were leaps and bounds past yes. where they were when yeah, they went public. Stuff, so, so I'm sure their investor base is putting a lot of pressure on them to get something out. Yeah. It is that, okay, so we talk a lot about these pivots, right? And mm -hmm. in going to the consumer space, Business decision wise, be upfront about it, be smart about it, understand the market. It's probably a much faster time to revenue for mm -hmm. them. But the volume's gonna be low, the revenue's gonna be super low, um, but it'll be revenue generating, right? There isn't like you're competing with hundreds of consumer electronic battery manufacturers that are out there overseas where price is an insanely competitive thing, mm -hmm. right? Reliability mm -hmm. and everything else. Now, Maybe they build a phone that lasts for two days. Honestly, I don't know if that's actually something you need to do. I mean, um, it's it's kind of like what we hear with fleet conversations. You know, a lot of those guys come back to their depot and they, they're going to charge their truck overnight. It's like, you, right. I'm not but, up 24 hours. Yeah, but um, to Annie's point too, I mean, you're public. You need to generate revenue. You need to like have some growth there and you need to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but it sort of feels like... A, you know, this is what we pitch. This is our vision. This is like, you know, what we're going to do. I wonder also if they didn't meet the bar mm. because the automotive like industry the performance requirement is so much harder mm -hmm. than the yeah. consumer side. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I take it that that's probably a big piece to that pivot. I mean, it's got to be conversations that they've been having or, you know, maybe in their partnerships with some of these groups like like VW and, and BMW just being like, hey, guys, this, this, might, this, this ain't going to cut it because yeah. our consumers are not going to like this experience that they're going to get from whether it's a charging perspective or a range perspective. Um, it kind of comes down to what we talk about a lot. Not only is it transparency, but it's that customer experience that comes with you being candid with what your products actually do. Um, so I think to your point, maybe it just didn't live up to the hype of like, you know, yeah, we could put this in an EV, in an electric vehicle, and it's going to be leaps and bounds better than what anybody else is going to do. But in reality, once you got past like the coin cell level, maybe they're like, wow, coin cell level was great. Let's go market that. It's a hard, <laughs> yeah. Let's, and let's just do that because that was so much but, easier. I mean, shit. Like, <laughs> we, I mean, we built our first coin cell in what, 2020? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And like, and we built hundreds of coin cells since then. It's easy to get. Now, getting to production is is harder. Um, it takes a lot of capital. It's a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't want to throw too much shade, right, in terms of, like, where yeah. we are versus anybody else. No shade thrown. Um, all no, it's I do think pivot. it's so fascinating. Like, QuantumScape is one of these companies that sort of went public in that SPAC boom 2020, 2021, if we look at the other companies in that uh, wave, the number of pivots we've seen recently is massive. Um, I mean, yeah. Nikola, is there anyone who hasn't pivoted? Maybe Solid that's Power? That's a good question, Mark. Yeah, um, I think, think Solid, but no, but Solid Power, like, didn't they originally just only want to work with, like, BMW, and now they've, like, gone, they've gone out to, but like... It, 
But to Annie's point, I mean, how many are following? We saw one company turn into a solar company. Like they did mm-hmm. another merger, yeah. right? They like sort of de yeah. and then kind of what merger, I would say yeah. reverse merged again and became a solar company. Um, yeah. We've seen. Yeah, that one's interesting. We've seen people set, go from being vehicle manufacturers to contract manufacturers. Yep. Um, you yeah. saw one battery company get bought by another D SPAC company and then fold. Um, mm-hmm. And then you've got one company that's about to, or they D spac once and then they went out and announced another SPAC deal. We've seen one. Yeah, yep, like uh, it's, it's everything, right? Like pitching vehicle products and then shifting complete market spaces to like commercial, then shifting back, then. Moving around, um, Cash battery, burns, hydrogen to battery electric, back to hydrogen. Yeah, um, yeah. We just need. I'm I'm rooting for some of these companies to just start delivering, being successful yeah. and succeeding and delivering. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We yeah. just us. We, yeah. It doesn't we, help the sentiment from investors or even the market that this is even like a capable thing until people are delivering. I mean. Not to hate on Arrival, well, but Arrival's been talking micro factories and partnership with UPS, and then they're like, oh, wait, we, we're going to leave the UK and we're going to focus solely on the US. I mean, honestly, as a founder, man, like there are so many things I want to do, yeah. and like there's so much innovation and stuff it. out there. Like, <laughs> yeah. it is really hard to not chase everything mm-hmm. that's there. Um, and it's very frustrating when you can't do it. Yeah. Um, and I think I like, I think we're doing a pretty darn good job of staying focused. Well, I think like the, the, we've done really good, right. At staying focused. Um, and I wonder sometimes if like these companies that raise like a billion, $2 billion, they just like all of a sudden it's like, they're, they're not experienced enough in terms of like understanding what the market is and what you're trying to do. And they're like, they see like all of a sudden the blinders are off and the cash is in the bank. And they're like, we're going to do all this stuff. And there's these cool things. Mm -hmm. And part of my pitch is micro factory and like, Mm -hmm. do that stuff. I could talk micro factories all day and maybe we should on a different one. Um, But like, does it make sense to do that right this moment versus maybe like, what is your core thing? And maybe your core thing is not what you think it is. Um, and do that little thing, right? Like get out there and do, do something it really else. well. I didn't yeah. interesting. Maybe, yeah. I think like part of what you might be saying is like, uh, being over resourced or having like an abundance of cash, um, and just burning it because you're allows, using too many things. Allows, well, it allows these companies to, um, feel safe and, and kind of maybe fumble around. Whereas, uh, if you're, if things are tight. Uh, you keep it tight. Yeah, and we've kept it very, very tight. Um, we haven't had um, billions in the bank yeah, yet. Which so. uh, we, you and I got to have a conversation. I think we'll talk about it in our one-on-one tomorrow. Um, <laughs> prior conversation that I had, <laughs> well, uh, which all this sort of looping back to it because uh, Victor and I had this discussion yesterday. We were talking about um, you know do what everybody else is doing. And then just market the product was like sort of a viewpoint that he's seen in the industry. And that's like what he's getting from Mm -hmm. others that are competitive to us. They're like, don't do anything different on technology. Don't do anything different on like approach or anything. Just like be the same as everybody else and like market your business and your product. It doesn't work. Like I've, I don't like, I've seen, I've actually in my past, uh, I had somebody request that I do that for a product and I didn't do it. And I'm so thankful I didn't because yeah. you're not like, you're not disrupting or pushing or differentiating yourself. And your brand is only as powerful as like your messaging and marketing and like how loud you are and how vocal you are and what that product experience is mm-hmm. truly. Um, and if you're starting off, like you're fighting against everybody else and everybody else is wearing the same clothes. Everybody else is wearing this, you know, they have the same tone. Mm -hmm. They sound the same. It's like really, really hard to differentiate yourself when all you have is like a little patch. Yeah. And go, and go capture a market in in, in doing that. So, so so I think like, sorry, on this topic, like when I think about a company making a pivot like that, um, 
my only concern for anybody doing that is what are you doing different to the other hundreds that are in the space that makes the most sense? And I'll go back to the advice I got once from a prior founder from another company. Um, and he once told me, he said, listen, investors are going to tell you what to do and they're going to apply pressure on you and everything else. He said, if your vision of what you're doing is really, truly important, it's going to work. If the technology is there or it's going to get there, whatever that is, he said, remain focused on that and keep driving towards that because what the investors are looking for might be like, I need to like have an immediate return or it's a near term like, I need ROI to Annie's point. They're mm-hmm. getting mm-hmm. sort of like um, they're tired, right? Like they're like, Impatient. listen, you've been doing yep. this for a while. It's too long, whatever. But that pivot can be potentially catastrophic yep. to where you're trying to go. So always make sure that when you're making those decisions, why are you different? How are you going to different, like, differentiate yourself? How are you going to bring long-term value, not short-term immediate value to the organization and company? And what strategy are you following that is going to allow you to get to that point? And if you're mm-hmm. not doing the right thing, and if it doesn't make sense, you're not going to get there. Don't do it. Yeah. And don't, yeah, mm-hmm. to your point, don't do that. Cause if you're not going to get to that point in your vision, then what's the point yeah. of taking or that trip? If you're going to pivot, like pull a slack, Right, like, Slack is always like the perfect pivot example. Yeah. Right. Where they just, they had built something and realized it had better product market fit. Right. Elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think what's, what's interesting about that is like, that's product market fit is everything. Yeah. Yep. If you have a product and fit, you have business, you're done. Exactly. Everything else can be solved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you have, if you pivot and you sacrifice product market fit, you don't have any, you might be able to do something cool for a little bit, but yeah. it's not going to yeah, be yeah. Big. yeah. It's like a Kickstarter campaign, right? You can sell like the <laughs> first thousand, make a few bucks and then you're done. Yeah. Cool. So I think that concludes today's episode guys. Once again, if you found any of the stuff that we talked about insightful, um, if we've ruffled your feathers, anything, any way, shape or form, like, let us know. We want to engage with you guys. If you thought, you know, some of the stuff was great, refer the show over to people because we don't run marketing ads for the show, um, anything like that. So we'd love to, you know, hear some feedback from you guys and have conversations via social media. Um, you know, you can reach all of us probably either LinkedIn or whatever it might be on social, but, um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, whatever we have with our groups, reach out and let us know. 